been. We're focused and dedicated our energies towards resuming our nonprofit status with the town of Born. The year has been filled with lots of activity, resuming old events while developing new ways to generate ideas and town-wide support for the TPA. The development of a web page thanks to Peter, Neil, and Joe Acati <coughs> and the other Cape Volk School. This project is soon to become a reality. TPA sponsorship program conceived and initiated by Joe Acati. This program will give us the ability to tie business people in the town to the TPA Association. We resumed our fa famous pasta dinner, thanks to Terry Harrington, who provided the sauce and meatballs, which she donated. The event was coordinated by Edie Cardoza, who was assisted by Maria Pires, Kathy Benetti, and Addie Perrara in making it the huge event it was. Also, a big thank you to Edie for going to the town businesses and having them donate prizes to our raffle. The TPA was able to collect $450 to give to the Bourne High School Athletic Fund. Monthly coffee events of the town-wide interest were our police and fire and infectious disease reports and senior affairs, which will be this morning, rounded out the series. It's been a year we can all be proud of. Now, for what you've all been waiting for, Kathy has over 30 years of experience in helping senior citizens become aware of the programs they are entitled to. I present our speaker, Kathy McDougall. Thanks, Joe. I just want to say welcome and thanks for having me. Um, as Joe said earlier, I've been doing this for around 30 years. I worked in the nursing home business as uh, an activity person when I started. I went to admissions, I went to marketing, and then I went to uh, a little bit bigger. My, our company expanded, and then I was the director of marketing and liaison for the Royal Health Group in town Falmouth and north of here. I retired about seven years ago, and I didn't know what to do with myself. For those of you that have been retired, how was it when it first happened? What did you do? Cleaned your house, cleaned out the garage, met with people, had some lunches, called some people that you hadn't seen for a long time, and then you go, okay, so now what am I going to do? That's what happened to me. So thankfully, I got a couple calls, and I did some consulting for a couple years. And then after that, I said, I really don't want to do the nursing homes anymore. So I went back to school, got certified to become an elder advocate. And do any of you know what an elder advocate is? No? All I do is stick up for people. That's all I do in the elder community. So my job is uh, I have clients in the nursing home. I go to visit them. I make sure that they're well taken care of. I go to homes. People will call me and say, my mom's failing or my dad's failing. I don't know what to do. Can you come into the home and visit and tell us what we need to do? So I go in and then I look and I see that the home is disheveled. There's not much food, or the food is expired, or the medication box that they're taking is full. And I'm like, oh, we have some problems here. Or they'll show me their checkbook. And I see all these checks written out to people, uh, like on TV, uh, or these charities, or people that these people don't even know. And I say, well, I think we have a big problem here. We've got some financial problems. We've also got some emotional problems because the mother's in the house and she's isolated all day. All she does is sit there. She has no one to talk to. She doesn't have a phone because she doesn't know how to work the phone. The only person she sees in a whole day is the mailman. So there's some real issues there that I try to help the family guide them through the stages of aging. So now, all of you, can I ask you, who's uh, 
below the age of 65. Okay, so you haven't got your Medicare cards yet. <laughs> Who else is below the age of 65? Okay, so no Medicare cards yet, right? So all of you that are 65, do you have a Medicare card? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so all of you paid into the Social Security system to get your Medicare card. Do you have a supplement card besides Medicare? Can you raise your hand? Okay, a few of us. Do you know how Medicare works? Not really. I mean, Mary Beth knows because she's in the business. I've known her for a long time. We were in the business together. But Medicare is a little convoluted. You know, every month you get it taken out of your Social Security. Am I right? Yeah, so we don't even see that charge. It just comes directly out of Social Security. But what does it actually do? Well, when you go to the hospital, it pays for your services. If you go to a nursing home, it will pay for your services, but there's a 20% charge that Medicare does not cover, and that's when you need a supplement insurance like a Blue Cross, an AARP, and I can get into that further, but you can ask me later about how that works. And then how about healthcare proxies? Who has a healthcare proxy? Some of you don't. Do you know what a healthcare proxy does? Anyone? Mary Beth, what does a healthcare proxy do? It allows the healthcare proxy to be able to get information medically. Um, if your loved one was at the hospital and you called up and you said, you know, how's my mother doing? If you weren't the healthcare proxy, you wouldn't be able to get any information. Right. It's a very, very important thing to have mm -hmm. a trusted person mm -hmm. to be your healthcare proxy. This is a healthcare really proxy. Important. And what I did was I went on mass.gov. If any of you are good with the computer or you know somebody that's good with the computer or you want to ask me, I'll get you a healthcare proxy. I actually have about 20 here. This is really important. And you know, I worked in the business for a very long time and I didn't even have one knowing what it does because it's extremely important. I never had one of these until I was 65. And I'm like, what if something had happened? So say something happened to me and I didn't have anything like this. You go to the hospital and I can't speak because I've had a brain injury. And they're trying to talk to me and they don't know what to do. They find a phone number on my phone and they call the number and it ends up being my husband. He comes over and they say, well, we have to make some important decisions. Well, he can make some decisions for me because he's my husband, but what if it was a friend of mine that came over because I wasn't married or I didn't have any family? And they said, does she have a health care proxy? And you said, I don't think so. Well, there's nobody there to make the decision for me, so I just lay there until the state gets involved and that becomes a whole other big issue. There's guardianship, there's conservatorship, there's all these things that have to take place, and it's really pricey. So if you just have a simple healthcare proxy, this will eliminate all the amount that you're gonna spend, the trauma, all those decisions, all those problems that you're going to have as you age. This is very simple. You can get this online. I, like I said, you don't have to go to an attorney for this. An attorney's great, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but everybody should have a simple health care proxy, which you can get on mass.gov. Yes, sir? Can you have more than one health care proxy? Yes, there's a place for your primary health care proxy. So say it was wife. You have your wife make the decisions for you if you're unable. And also, you have to be un incompetent to use this oftentimes. So, if I'm in a coma, my husband comes in and they say, well, do you have a healthcare proxy right here? I can make all the decisions for her because I know her wishes. I'll give you a perfect example. My sister passed away 18 years ago, very suddenly, 45 years old from a brain aneurysm. She was going through a divorce, had only been separated for about three weeks. She was a nurse. So we talked about some things while she was going through her divorce and what she should do. She didn't change the will, but we did talk about 
healthcare proxies. And thank God, she made a new healthcare proxy, and I was her healthcare proxy. So the day we got the call that she was unresponsive at Cape Cod Hospital, I went down, and we knew she was not going to survive. The neurologist said to me, who's her healthcare proxy? Because now she's got a husband that she's not with anymore. I'm her sibling. And I said, I am. He said, well, we have to make some important decisions here. Can I see the healthcare proxy? I gave it to him. We, she became an organ donor. And I was able to make all those decisions for her because she was still alive technically on life support. If somebody's not alive, obviously you're not going to use this, but she was still alive. I could make all decisions for her going forward in terms of her life support, organ donation, and so forth. So this is really important to have, and you just put it somewhere. If something happens and somebody knows you, well, wait a minute, I think Edie's got a healthcare proxy in her drawer. Let's go get it. Let's see who she's appointed as a healthcare proxy. And if that healthcare proxy is not available, you look at the alternate. Maybe somebody moved away or they passed away and this hasn't been updated. So the second person becomes the one that can make the decisions for that person. Do you have any questions on this? No, did, was it pretty simplified? Yes. Does the primary get that copy also? Is that what you're saying? Yes. You can make a copy of it for the primary. Yes, and you the do. Would take over. You do. Right. We keep the original. Like you put this original in your legal stuff or a drawer that's important. And then you give this like to your daughter or somebody, and they get a copy of this so they know that if they have to go to the hospital, they've got this copy with them. And they go to the hospital, and they make the decisions for you. And you know, you think you're healthy. You think everything's OK. And then all of a sudden, something happens. In May, um, I was put on um, a blood pressure medicine in March. And it was just because my doctor said, both times you've been here, your blood pressure's been elevated. So we're going to put you on this low-dose blood pressure medication. And it's, it's OK. It's not going to affect you. And I'm like, OK. Well, I was on this for uh, three months. I got bit by a wasp. And I had this what's called an anaphylactic rea um, reaction. Blew up all over the place. I could breathe OK. But the doctor put me on prednisone. And I was on a heavy dose of prednisone. The day after I got off the prednisone, I fainted at the soccer field at Bourne High School in front of all these people and my granddaughter. And it was because of this blood pressure medicine. And I was out cold. And thankfully, there were some people that knew me. And they said, we, we know who she is. Let's just ship her out, ship her to the hospital, call her husband. But my daughter was there. But I was thankful. What if this happened to you, and you're living alone? And I don't know if any of you have lifelines or a telephone handy that you need, too, because things happen. I've seen it so many times over the years. So that's really important. But again, let's go back to elder advocacy in a minute. You know, being an elder advocate, I've seen a lot of things. I've seen emotional abuse take place. I've seen financial abuse take place. We were talking about this earlier. You know, I went to my attorney a few years ago to set up a trust. And um, we're talking about my children. And she said, you know, you're going to do this for your children and so forth. Do you trust your children? I said, yes, I do. Do you trust their spouse? I do. But what if I didn't? I don't know the spouses that well. I mean, I know them. They're in my family. They've been there for a long time. But if I'm going to divide my estate or have decisions made, do I really trust the in-laws? I do. But do you? Those are things to think about. You know, do I trust my children? Will my children make the right decisions for me? Will they steal me blind? The minute I pass out and I have to go to a nursing home, are they in my bank and taking all my money? It happens. I had someone come to my nursing home years ago, and this lady was being admitted for rehab. And we thought she might be staying long term. So you have to look at the financial picture for long term. 
how are they going to pay their debt? How are they going to pay for the nursing home, right? They've got Medicare. They have Blue Cross. They're covered for about 100 days if they're going to be eligible. But if they stay after 100 days, how are they going to pay this? Well, there's the son across from me. And I said, OK, so it looks like your mom might be long-term care. How can you pay for this? Now, I don't want to know all the details of their financial picture. I don't have to know. I don't want to know. What I do want to know is, how are you going to pay the bill? So he says, well, my mom can do this. I said, OK, great. And he said, but I'm just telling you right now, the house is mine. OK. I said, There's, there is some factors that go along with transferring of the house. There's, it's called a look back time. So if you have a house and you want to give it to one of your children, there has to be so many years, like five or six years in between. Yes, he's going to help me. Is it five? It is five. I wasn't sure. I've been out of it for a while, but I've heard six, too. But if you transfer the house and it hasn't been transferred for five years, it's not really their house. It's still mom's house. But he's sitting there across from me saying, it's my house. And I said, OK, when did all this happen? Last week. Oh, well, I'm sorry, but your mom is going to have to pay for her stay after her Medicare runs out. Anything over $2,000 is considered an asset. And you've got your mom's house. You just told me it's on the water down in Chatham, and it's worth a million. But it's yours now. It's mine. OK, so that's not for me to decide. And it's not for me to judge. I say to them all the time, go see an attorney. Go see an attorney. Go to an elder attorney that can maybe help you with this situation. Because it's not for me to help. All I need to know is how you're going to pay this. Well, guess what happened? Mom came in. And mom was really sick. <coughs> Nobody wanted her. But when they found out from the attorney that they couldn't keep the house and all her money, mom went home. And they found somebody to take care of her because they wanted to keep that million dollar house. Mm -hmm. So there's things that happen. And as much as you love your children, you have to have these conversations. And you have to know and feel what's going to happen. I mean, your money is their money most times anyways. You work hard, you help your children, and that's what it's all about. But make sure they're doing it right. Make sure you're getting what you need first. And then if things work out, you can leave your children money. But if things don't, just make sure it's all protected and protected right. So I'm not an attorney. I work with two attorneys. But I'm not an attorney. And what I would say to you all is if you have any questions, if you have any financial situations, you can talk to, what's your first name again? Joe. Joe here about finances as we get older. How do we protect them? How do we make more money? How do we get a health care proxy from me or online? How do we do a power of attorney? Do you know what a power of attorney is? Power of attorney is only good when you're alive. That helps you with decision making, too. So say mom is uh, in a rehab, and you have to pay her bills while she's in rehab. Power of attorney gives you that right to make mom's bills, pay her bills while she's in the hospital. If you want a durable power of attorney, it gets a little bit more complicated. That means, like, when you have a power of attorney, mom's just in for rehab. You can make her decisions while she's in rehab. But if mom's incompetent or she has brain injury, you need a durable power of attorney. Again, that's when you go see your attorney and ask these important questions. Yes? Yeah, every power of attorney should be a durable power. That's if correct. People don't understand if you get the coma or you're incompetent. Uh, the original power of attorney is no good. You have one. <laughs> you have one. He's asking about a durable power of attorney. He's a, and which, He's a lawyer. Oh, you're a lawyer. Yay. A lawyer. So go see him. Yeah. <laughs> go see him. I'm like the doctor that never had to yeah. vaccinate. Well, you know. You know. <laughs> I, I take care of my clients first. Yep. Yep. But, but, but you're right. But a lot of times we get um, in the. I'm a non-durable 
in the last 20 or 30 years. But you know what? Some people come in and they'll get it offline, a power of attorney, and they come in and we honor those in the nursing home, correct? correct. We honor just a plain power of attorney. But it's much better if you have a durable because then you can do whatever you need to do. This person can really help you. So those are some of the things I do. And then, like I said, um, I act as their, one lady said, you're acting as my savior. I'm not acting as the savior. I'm just trying to help. I'm going into the home and trying to make things easier, better for the person at home to live. How many people here live by themselves? OK. Do you have somebody to help you if needed? I know you do, Paul. Yep. You have Claire. Edie, you have your daughter. Who else raised their hand? And you have your son. But the people that don't have anybody, it gets really complicated. And it's very hard. Like, what do I do? <coughs> I met, uh, does anyone know Sue who lives at the corner right down at Academy Drive? She's the last house before Mass Maritime. I don't know her last name. But she's a single woman. Her, her family, she has a niece and nephew that are out of town. And we were talking last night. I was riding my bike, and we were just talking about a few things. And I mentioned the program, and she said, I'm going to try to come. She's alone. I don't know what her situation is, but as we were talking, I mentioned a health care proxy. She says, you know, I don't have one. I don't know how old she is, but I thought, oh, you know, there's nobody around, and what if something happens? You just, it's so important. Am I right with the health care proxy? It really is so important, and anything can happen. Like, I can faint at the soccer game, or, you know, or, or my sister can die suddenly, and then what, what do we do? You know, you just have to be prepared. But I don't want to talk about that anymore. I want to ask you, what are some of your concerns with aging? Can I get somebody out here to maybe answer that question? And I know one that somebody's got to say it. I hope you do. What's, what are some of the concerns you have? I, I have neuropathy okay. in my feet, so I'm walking of falling. Yep, safety. I, I, I actually broke my neck uh, several years ago and have uh, four inches of titanium uh, in, in me that I... So you're afraid to fall. With. Yeah, absolutely. And Mary Beth is an occupational therapist here. You should talk to her after. <laughs> but seriously, falls, falls are a big thing with getting older. Do any of you know or realize that when we get older, balance is harder? Like trying to stand on one foot for a length of time. Did you ever try it? Did you ever try it? Not easy, is it? I go to a balance class to do this. What else? What other things that um, are concerning as we get older? Yes, sir. Avoiding scams. I'm uh, fine at the moment. Avoiding but scams. Now, I'll probably sign right up. Yes, well, I, as I told you, the woman I was uh, went to her house and her checkbook wrote, there was uh, charities written out and people that she didn't know. And one thing led to another, and there was about $100,000 taken out of her account. And then I got her some help, and then we worked it out with the son. And you now she's in a nursing home. But how do you avoid scams? When you think you see something um, on the internet, and you keep getting this constantly, or you're getting these phone calls, call your police. That's what they're there for. Call 911 or call the business line and say, I keep getting these calls or people come, keep coming to my doors and I keep getting these emails and I feel like they're taking my money. Two weeks ago, my debit card got scammed for the third time. You know what I did? I'm no longer with that bank. Three times was plenty. And I really liked the bank, but for some reason, my debit card kept getting picked up. And I'm not going to put myself in that position because I just didn't. I, thankfully, I, I look at my bank every couple weeks and I saw all these charges. So I finally decided I don't want this bank anymore. But those, that's a big thing, getting scammed. Yes, sir. So I, I want to just add, I'm Joe Cardi, and uh, I happen to be a financial advisor for 50 years. And that's part of um, elderly abuse. Yes. The scam situation, right? And I see it. I just want to give you a couple of examples of elderly abuse. It happens in my More than practice. you know. It happens 
four, five, six times a year. All right, now I'll give you one example of how I had an elderly lady that was a client for 35 or 40 years. Her husband had died 35 or 40 years before that. She lived in a trailer park. Uh, she died with $1.8 million, so she was very, very frugal. She had some friends she had had in the trailer park for probably 20 or 30 years, younger people, probably 20 years younger. They befriended her when she got older. I mean, really befriended her. He started, uh, uh, it was a husband and wife kind of scam type thing. So the husband started to come to all the meetings to review portfolios. And, and she really only had one relative whom I couldn't get a hold of. But it was my, it was my obligation as a financial advisor with fiduciary responsibility to help protect her. So he would come in all the time. He would sit up in the waiting room for a while. After a while, he wanted to be in the meeting. She wants me to be here. So one day we isolated them. We asked, and, and she didn't want him to be involved in anything. Mm -hmm. So then I got a call that she wanted to change her beneficiaries. <coughs> this really happened. Wanted to change her beneficiaries. And I said, well, to who? I said, to Paul, your nephew? No, no, I haven't seen him in 10 years. No, no, no. These people help me all the time. You know the guy that brings me in? And I want to make them beneficiaries. Well, I worked on this for probably six months to kind of dissuade her from not doing that. Eventually, she said, this is what I want to do. And we have to do it. So we changed beneficiaries. So they were getting all of her money. Well, that was a big red flag to me. So I started to get the police involved. As it turns out, about a year later, I had her make Paul half beneficiary, at least get some of it away from this person. Eventually got the police involved. We got um, an estate planning attorney to draw a protective trust, and Dawn could speak to that, to protect her. And just as, as this guy was going to take and move the assets to another advisor whom he knew, we stopped him. Good. Totally stopped. It was the best thing I've done in my career, for anybody, and as a person. So he was going to get $1.8 million. Wow. So it, as it turns out, um, the guy, they were just bad people. We stopped the whole thing. He called me up and he said, I know it's you who stopped this. And I said, absolutely. I'm the one who stopped it. And every time I called the police, just so you know, the police would not get involved. They said, do you have any proof? Well, look it, I see it happening. I'm a financial advisor. It's my obligation to do this. Well, it was a really bad situation. We did save the money. Uh, she eventually passed away. We saved the money. They put it into a protective trust. And everything was great. Um, the, the, the nephew, Paul, was like, now he's about eight years old, I think. Uh, Paul calls me on a Sunday on my cell phone, and he says, we're cleaning out Marion's bedroom. It's the last piece of furniture to come out. It's a nightstand, and we found some really, really disturbing things in there. And I said, what? Well, there were naked pictures of the husband and wife in her nightstand. Oh. Mm. That is total abuse. Yeah. This happens every day in my practice. Not that bad. And then the other thing is talking about abuse by family members. Mm -hmm. Typically, when they come into my office, I, at this point, can smell something. Oh, we're going to take care of Ma now because, you know, uh, we know she's sick. And, uh, and, and I, I kind of tell them ahead of time, I have to protect my client. But it's generally family members who want everything at the end. There's four siblings. Mm -hmm. And because they're taking care of the person for the last year or two, they, they eventually get everything changed over to their name. So you have to be really careful for everybody in your life. Even though you love your kids, and mm -hmm. I love my kids, uh, you have to protect yourself and, and see your financial advisor, see your estate planning attorney, see your attorney, see your elder care planner. Uh, that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. that's, that's so good. You know, I've seen it so many times in my 30 years. I mean, I gave one example, but... There's so many times that I've seen, and it's, it's unfortunate, but I've seen the children. Children are the first ones to take advantage of mom and dad. They're, you know, mom's not doing well, dad's not doing well. 
maybe he has a diagnosis of dementia. This is the time that we can go in and start looking at everything. And then the next thing you know, mom's in a nursing home and whatever the payer source may be, but dad is just flailing and we're gonna just take the money. So those are the things that can happen and that's my job to go in and hopefully help that so that it doesn't happen. But we were talking about things that um, are difficult as you get older and Paul mentioned um, falling. Safety is a big issue. You know, if you fall, you break your shoulder, you know, you break a hip, you break a leg or something, you go into the hospital to get it fixed, you get pneumonia while you're there. Then you end up in a nursing home. These things all have to be thought about a lot. You know, you have to really think about things like this that do happen, and they do happen, and I've seen it. But I'm waiting for one of you to tell me what's one of your biggest concerns that you have with aging. Memory. Memory. Who has memory thoughts like all the time? Does, do, do you struggle with memory sometimes? We all do. We're all getting older. We struggle with memory problems. This is a good one. My doctor, about five years ago, he's now retired. We talk about everything. He's my general practitioner. He says to me, how's your memory, Kathy? Um, I guess it's OK. He asked me a couple questions. I think I answered OK. He said, well, what is the problem? And I said, my problem is sometimes I forget what I'm going to say, or I have trouble with word finding, or I go into the kitchen, and I'm like, OK, so what am I here for? Those type things. Does anybody have those problems? Sure. <laughs> yeah, we all do, right? You know what one of his, his things were to me was, um, and this goes for especially women, too many things going on in the brain at one time. So this is what a woman does. And correct me if I'm wrong, you women. OK, so we're writing out a grocery list. The phone rings. We answer the phone. Then somebody's at the door. And then your husband walks in the other way. And then all of a sudden, you said, what was I supposed to do? You had five things going on in the brain. And you forgot everything because we're trying to work out five things, and you can't work out five things as you get older. We have to do one or two, but we worry. We're thinking, oh no, do I have dementia? Am I at the beginning of Alzheimer's? Am I right? Am I right? Do you all think that? My mom had dementia. Am I getting dementia? I think it all the time, and this is what I do for a living. But my, my doctor said, would you stop? Just stop. You got too many things. You're working, you're going here, you're picking up the phone, you're doing this, you're doing that. How do you think you're going to forget? Of course you're going to forget. But if we start focusing a little bit, like, OK, I'm going to do this one task. I'm not answering that phone while I'm, like, my phone's ringing right now. I'm talking. Should I answer the phone and then write down the message? Then I come back and I say, what was I talking about? Those are the things that happen to us as we get older, and they're normal. They're normal. You don't have dementia. You don't have Alzheimer's. It's just normal parts of aging. Our brain shrinks as we get older. We can't put a lot of information in there anymore. It just doesn't work. You know how your bones age, and our women, uh, most women have to go for bone tests, and then um, we, you know, our faces change, the wrinkles come. Well, our brain ages, and it gets tinier. Not much, but tinier. So we can't put in all that information. So if you start to think about tricks like, okay, I'm going to write this down, or I'm not answering that phone because I'm doing something really important like doing my finances. Brain teasers. Do any of you do like search a word or wordle or crosswords? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. That's really good for your brain. It just keeps you going. I do wordle every day. I have a group of people that we try to guess the word. And there are some days when I say, oh my god, I'm never going to figure out this word. And I walk away from it. And about a half hour later, I'll come back and I'll go, I know what it is. But at the time, I'm watching TV, 
my phone is ringing, somebody's at my back door, and I, how am I going to focus on getting Wordle, right? So there's, I could go on and on and on about aging and what you should do and healthcare proxies and abuse and elder advocacy and falls and brain and all that. Um, do any of you uh, go to the Council on Aging downtown? Okay. They have some wonderful programs there. Um, this is one of their newsletters, and you're certainly welcome to look at it. But they have a lot of different things down there that they can explain um, what goes on. I mean, they even have an attorney uh, that comes in once a month, elder law appointments, that if you want to discuss a power of attorney, if you want to um, address trust or anything like that, they have exercise programs. Who here exercises? Even a little. Who walks? Anybody walk? Wow, that's great. Anybody ride your bike with a helmet like you're supposed to? OK. Does anybody go up and down a few stairs every day? Good. That's really good. Even a little exercise in changing your food habits. Like as we get older, we don't need all the body fat. We need some fat to su sustain and protein but we don't need a whole lot of chocolate. We don't need you know, a whole pizza. We need to think about that too because that all affects us too as we get older. We get acid indigestion. We get stuff that our brain's not functioning because we've drank too much that night. Things like that. There's a whole lot of things that happen when we age, but you know what? We're here, it's good. And these are just a few tips for you as you go forward. If this can be any help to you, then I've done my job. Edie was just mentioning the Born Council on Aging, and that's what this uh, newsletter is. And I get it monthly. I mean, they even have lunches down there if you want to get a lunch. They're starting a lunch, and they have a very good chef. There's an article about him on the front page. He worked at um, quite a few nice places over the year, and uh, I think he's in his retirement year, so he just wants to do some little things now. But they have the Connection Cafe for people that maybe have somebody in their family that has Alzheimer's or dementia, and they just need a couple of hours away. Um, they have exercise programs, team trivia for our brain, coffee talk and social. Um, Sue over here, she goes to the coffee talk on Wednesdays. Oh, and you go to, and then Friday they have a craft program. So I don't do all of them. I don't have time because I, I am still working. But I do like to go to the yoga, which is good for stretching for us as we get older. That's very important. And again, going back to Paul, yeah, awesome. it helps with safety, balance, and it just stretches everything so you're a little bit limber because we do stiffen up as we get older. So if we can make ourselves a little limber, you know, yoga is a great practice. So um, if that's it, nobody has any other questions? So where are they located? Right down in the community building, community building. Down, down on Main Street. So yeah. right across from my husband's Coastal Motors. Right. It's called the old Veterans Building, Edie. Is that it? Yes, and they have the Veterans Coffee. What is it, two days a month? Two days on a, on a Wednesday, Edie? Every Wednesday. I mean, Sue. Every second Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Second Wednesday of every month, there's yeah. a Veterans yeah. Coffee. Yeah. You should go to this, Paul. Yeah. Yes. I have a couple of times. Yes, so they were asking about the programs, and yes, sir. I'd just like to add one thing that, that you know, they've seen these ads that are turning, you can go to a hotel, you got a free lunch, and they give you this talk about trust. Uh, I, I've seen some, some terrible results. Uh, people don't understand that, that an irrevocable trust is irrevocable. Um, and if you just sign the deed over to the kids to, mm -hmm. you know, protect the house, um, with the best kids in the world, I've had several That's cases. Right. One bankruptcy judge, he doesn't care. D d divorce judge, he doesn't care. A plaintiff uh, that gets a judgment, he doesn't care. <laughs> well, that's my house. I gave it to him. I'll just take it back. No, no, you can't. You can't mm -hmm. take it back. So, mm -hmm. you know, take some time. And be, That's right. Especially, and the children come and say, "Well, you know, it'll all go to taxes." <laughs> well, you earned it. If it all goes to taxes, so what? Um, mm -hmm. But it, there's there's different ways of doing it. Uh, and yes. I, I've seen so many cases where the where the deeds stay away from deeds. It, it, you know, if it's been in your name for a long time, 
you know, it's going to be valued at the date of death. So if you bought it for $5,000 in 1920, and now it's worth $500,000. If, if the beneficiary is not going to be living on it, just going to sell it, it's, it's a zero capital gain tax mm -hmm. if it's in your name, because it's stepped up valuation to 500, then they sell it for 500. If, it, you know, if you transferred it earlier, you take not that date of death, not that transfer date as the cost, you take the original so you're, mm -hmm. you know, you've Some free advice. You've got a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar capital gain, federal and state. You know, you just keep the house. <laughs> so some free advice there. You know, we have an attorney, and like I said, go see an attorney. But it's very important to do this and do it legal. And I mean, he just gave us some valuable advice about deeds. So think about that. Talk to him later or, or reach out to your attorney. Yes, Joe. And just one last thing. Um, there are elder care planning attorneys. Yes. There are uh, elder uh, uh, care planning attorneys <laughs> specifically to show you ways to maybe save money, but in a legal way. And that's a new specialty today. It wasn't around 20 years ago. Right. So that's a good place to begin. It really is. So, you know, we have a lot of resources right here. Yes, sir. She's, she's telling us about a knockbox at the Council on Aging. What is that? I live alone. If I were to have an emergency in my house and had to call 911, I've got the doors locked. I can't move. A knockbox they put outside your house, you put a spare key in it, and only the fire department has access to it. She's explaining about a knock box. Is it N O C? N K N? They say K N O X. Okay, knock box, yeah. which if she's living alone, there's oh, nobody to get in the house. Married, but you just happen to be alone. It's a key outside the house that only the fire department can access if something happens. So that's that's really good. So so all these little ideas hopefully has helped you and I talk too much. My husband says, don't talk too much. So I talk too much. So I hope you just got something out of it today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.